we are continuing our series on the Ten Commandments as we look at the second commandment. Exodus 20, 4 through 6 says, You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents, to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. So join me on this episode of the Methodical Methodist Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Methodical Methodist Podcast, a podcast where we talk about why the church is still relevant for us today as we explore themes connected to religion, politics, pop culture, faith, and yes, even the church. Together we can find out what it means to live into the mission of the church by making disciples. Now, let's get methodical. Hello everyone, I am your host, the Reverend Andrew Lay, and I'm excited to spend this time on the podcast today. If you like this show, I hope that you might take a minute to subscribe, rate, and write a review for the podcast. It helps to boost the show and make it to where more people can find it. You can also find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash methodicalpod, and you can find me on Instagram as well at methodicalpod. So be sure to check me out. The first commandment was given by God who said, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. This first commandment is closely related to the second commandment. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. In fact, the first two commandments are so closely related that some faith traditions consider them to be the same commandment. Moses had climbed Mount Sinai and received these laws from God, Moses had traveled up to the mountain to meet with God face to face, and all the people are left waiting for him. For 40 days and nights, Moses is away on this mountain, and the Israelites grow a little impatient. They go to Aaron, the brother of Moses, and they ask him to fashion them a tangible God that they can worship. They essentially say, It was nice of this fellow Moses to get us out of slavery, but he's gone. And we don't know what happened to him, so we want you to make a God for us. It only took 40 days and 40 nights for the people to move on and get impatient and move on to the next thing. Aaron tells the people, Take off the gold rings that are on the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Aaron gets all the people to pull all of their resources together And then he fashions a golden calf for the people to worship. Aaron then builds an altar in front of this golden calf, and he announces that the next day they will celebrate by having a festival to the Lord. So the next day the people get up early, sacrifice burnt offerings, and feast with one another. Meanwhile, Moses gets a notification from God who says, Go down at once. Your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt have acted perversely. They have been quick to turn aside from the way that I commanded them. They have cast for themselves an image of a calf, and have worshipped it and sacrificed to it, and said, These are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. God gets extremely angry, and God says, I have seen this people, how stiff-necked they are. Now let me alone, so that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them. And of you I will make a great nation. Moses hears this, and he tries to calm God down a little bit. Moses essentially says, Think about all that you've done. You have led us out of slavery. Think about your people. Think about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Remember the promise that you made to them to multiply their descendants. Luckily, after this little chat, God seems to calm down, and God changes God's mind. But then Moses comes down the mountain with the two stone tablets that contain the Ten Commandments, and he finds the people worshiping this golden calf. 
Moses, who just calmed God down, is now completely outraged. Moses is so angry that he throws the stone tablets to the ground and they shatter into pieces. He takes the golden calf, melts it down, pulverizes it into powder, and scatters it into the water, and then he makes the Israelites drink it. So we can see that Moses has a bit of a temper too. And the people have already broken the first and the second commandment before Moses had even given them a chance to see these rules. This trend of idol worship continues throughout all of Scripture. The Hebrew prophets constantly warn against idol worship and bowing down to false gods like the Semitic god Baal, the Moabite god Chemosh, the Philistine god Dagon, the Babylonian god Marduk, and the Canaanite god Moloch. The prophet Jeremiah speaks against the worship of false idols, and in his paraphrase of the Bible entitled The Message, Eugene Peterson writes these words from the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Don't take the godless nations as your models. Don't be impressed by their glamour and glitz. No matter how much they're impressed, the religion of these people is nothing but smoke. An idol is nothing but a tree chopped down, then shaped by woodsman's axe. They trim it with tinsel and balls, use hammer and nails to keep it upright. It's like a scarecrow in a cabbage patch, can't talk. Dead wood that has been carried can't walk. Don't be impressed by such stuff. It's useless for either good or evil. There's an old story that comes out of the Jewish tradition about Abraham and the idol shop. Abraham was the son of Terak, and Terak was an idol merchant. From an early age, Abraham questioned the idol worship of his father, and Abraham came to believe that the entire universe was created by one single God. One time when Terak had gone out, he left Abraham in charge to sell the idols in his place. A man came into the shop and asked to buy one. Abraham asked the man, How old are you? And the man said, Sixty years old. Then Abraham said, You are sixty years old and you would worship a day-old statue? The man was so embarrassed he went on his way. In another story, Abraham tries to convince his father Terak to stop engaging in the practice of idol worship. One day, when he was left alone in his father's shop, he took a hammer. Then Abraham smashed all of the idols except for the largest one. He then placed the hammer that he had used to destroy all of the idols into the hand of the one idol that was left standing. When his father returned, he asked what happened. Abraham said, A woman came in to make an offering to the idols. The idols started arguing about which one should eat the offering first. Then the largest idol took the hammer and smashed all the other idols. His father said, Don't be ridiculous. These idols have no knowledge. They can't do anything. To which Abraham replied, And yet you worship them. There's a part of human nature that likes having a visible image of God that we can see and touch. We are sometimes tempted to have a God that we can put in a box We want a God that we can point to and say, look, there is God. We want a God that we can go to and visit, but on our own terms. We don't always want a living and breathing God that works, moves, and challenges us. It was God who formed us out of the dust and breathed life into us and made us in God's image. God created us in God's own image, but we can often want to create God in our own image. Our understanding of God is often based on a reflection of ourselves and what we want God to look like and act like. In his book, The Ten Commandments from the Backside, Ellsworth Callis tells the story of a little boy who is drawing intently with his crowns. His mother asks, What are you drawing? The little boy says, I'm drawing a picture of God. His mother says, how can you draw a picture of God? Nobody knows what God looks like. The little boy replies, they will when I finish my picture. God is is so much more than just our idea of God. When we try to put God in a box, when we try to draw God with our crowns, 
then we are attempting to form an idol of God. God. God is not an idol, but God is alive and moving and working in our world. We can't put God in a box. We cannot manipulate God to meet our own wants, needs, and standards. God is not some unmoved mover who is up in the clouds and never bothers to interact with human beings. Instead, our God is actively participating in our lives and in our world around us. Perhaps this second commandment, you shall not make an idol, was given so that we would remember that God is not a plank of wood or a hunk of metal. Instead, God is all around us and constantly working in our lives. God is pretty clear when God presents the second commandment. There's not a lot of room for interpretation. God says, You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. Again, this goes back to the first commandment. God wants to be the one and only God. Now, chances are you don't sit around at home bowing down to carved images of various pagan gods. You probably don't have a bronze statue of the god Zeus that you pledge your allegiance to every morning when you wake up. Most likely, you're not guilty of making of yourself a literal idol, but idols are not just an Old Testament issue. They are a human issue. We have golden calves and sacred cows in our lives that compete for our attention and devotion. These idols don't have to be malicious or evil things for it to negatively affect our lives and our relationship with God. Oftentimes our sacred cows are actually good things. We idolize the people that we look up to. We idolize our families. We idolize our work and careers. And we also idolize our material possessions because we live in an age of consumerism. In commercials and on ads on social media, we are told to buy this product or that product because it is the thing that has been missing in our lives. And if we buy this product, then everything in our life will fall into place. And if that's not the definition of idolatry, then I don't know what is. We oftentimes idolize sports. People get so invested in their sports team that if they lose, it affects their mood. It even ruins their week. I know a lot of folks are worried right now as as if we're going to even have a, a football season this fall. But this commandment teaches us that we need to keep our priorities in place. God demands to be at the center of our lives. Scripture reminds us that our God is a jealous God. As the theologian Patrick Miller says, It is that uncompromising commitment and love that is in view when the Lord is jealous for Israel's complete trust. If we truly trust God, then we won't rely on these other idols and false gods. If we truly trust God, then we won't bother with all the sacred cows in our culture. If we truly trust God, then we will keep the first and the second commandment. One of my favorite authors is Henry Nouwen. He was a Dutch priest who wrote a book called The Wounded Healer. In his book, he tells of an old tale from ancient India. Four royal sons were questioning what specialty they should master. They said to one another, Let us search the earth and learn a special science. So they decided, and after they had agreed on a place where they would meet again, the four brothers started off each in a different direction. Time went by, and the brothers met again at the appointed meeting place, and they asked one another what they had learned. The first brother said, I have mastered a science which makes it possible for me to take a bone of some creature and create the flesh that goes with it. The second brother said, I know how to grow the creature's skin and hair if there is flesh on its bones. 
The third brother said, I am able to create its limbs if I have the flesh, the skin, and the hair. And the fourth brother concluded, and I know how to give life to that creature. So the four brothers went out into the jungle and they found a piece of bone so that they could demonstrate their specialties. As fate would have it, the bone they found was a lion's, but they didn't know it when they picked up the bone. One added flesh to the bone, the second grew hide and hair, the third completed it with matching limbs, and the fourth gave the lion life. Shaking its heavy mane, the ferocious beast arose with its menacing mouth, sharp teeth, and merciless claws, and jumped on its creators. He killed them all, and happily vanished into the jungle. We also have the capability of creating idols in our lives that can destroy us. Our ambition can consume us. Our possessions and material objects can distract us. But God calls us to avoid idol worship and to allow God to be our complete object of worship and devotion. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Methodical Methodist Podcast. If you have enjoyed this show, I hope you might consider heading on over to iTunes to subscribe, rate, and leave a review of the show. It is very much appreciated. And until next time, stay methodical.